Today we're taking March Madness, the best tournament in all of sports, and letting college football teams battle it out. Since college basketball has over 350 Division I programs, while college football only has about a third of that, I'm going to sim a season in NCAA football to see who makes the tourney, and the top 68 teams will get put into our bracket, but I also have to mention some colleges that got snubbed like Kentucky, Arizona, and Iowa. After all of that, I've seeded each of the colleges based on their ranking, and all four of the regional brackets are being shown right now, so we're ready to start the tournament, and it begins with the the first four, where 11 seeded Baylor and Maryland are playing first. This first round will take place on a neutral site, but then I'm going to let the higher seeds host all the way up until the final four, and Maryland's offense did not have a good day versus the Bears as they're going to lose 28-7. to Talia Tagovailoa couldn't carry his team, so Baylor will be playing LSU in the round of 64, but before that we have to head over to the Midwest region, where Pitt has found themselves as a 16 seed, and if they can't beat Charlotte, they're going to be knocked out already. They'd end up being okay though because they'd win this one by 38 points, and we'll see how they do in the round of 64 versus a one seed because they're going to have to face Oregon who did very well in the sim. Out in the west region, Washington got the one seed here and I did my best to seed teams regionally in this tournament. So if the Cougars come out on top of this one, they'd have to play their rivals next. And with two and a half minutes left, it looks like they have a two point lead, but they still have to get rid of the rest of the clock remaining. So it'll be interesting to see if they can get past Ohio. And that's a big stop. Third and four now for Cam Ward where he is not going to get the ball out. And that gives Curtis Rourke and the Bob that's 100 seconds to move it down the field just to get a field goal. Their tight end has already broken multiple tackles on this play, and I'm not sure what their kicker's range is, but I'm just excited to finally have a close matchup in this one. That's what makes March Madness so great, and on second and three, they're going to move the chains. So Washington State is in a lot of trouble. They need to get a sack or something, and that's exactly what they did, but why is no Ohio hiking the ball? They're going to run down as much clock as they can, and that means it all comes down to this third and 13, which it would have anyway. They're going for the deep shot, and it's dropped. That was amazing defense. Defense. And they would have kicked the game-winning field goal if they could have just held on. Now they have to send up the Hail Mary prayer, and it's going to be knocked down. The 16-seeded Cougars have somehow survived, so they're on to the next round, and they'll have an opportunity to upset their rivals. But before that, we need to finish out the first four games. And after this is when things get really fun, but I didn't realize Old Dominion had a 95 overall linebacker. And I guess we'll see if he can carry his team versus Mississippi State. Well, he might have done all right, but when your team has scored zero points with two minutes left in the fourth quarter, that's a problem. And all Mississippi State needs to do is get one more stop to seal this one, but they have scored. It was about time they found the end zone, but it's not going to matter, because even though they also got the two-point conversion, they'd have to recover multiple onside kicks, and that simply isn't going to be the case here. That means Mississippi State's made the round of 64, and they'll be playing Virginia Tech, which is a very winnable game. Now we get to head over to the South region, where Florida was the number one overall seed, and at an 84 overall, I have no idea how they pulled it off. If any one seed was going to get upset in this, it would probably be them, but UNLV had a hard hard time scoring points, so they are going to lose to the Gators. As long as Graham Mertz doesn't make many mistakes, his team could go far, and he'll be taking on another Florida school in the next round, but the question is which one of them it's going to be. Miami is the higher overall team on paper, but they have to play this one on the road as the lower seed, and that clearly did not stop them from smoking the Owls by 40 points. I was not expecting them to get blown out like that, but it should give us a good matchup in the next round, and we have another in-state battle coming up. I told you all, I tried to seed each team by their region pretty accurately, so the South is going to have a lot of colleges from there, but we're about to witness our first upset. Tulane went into this one as the five seed, but Louisiana Tech played much better even though they had to do this on the road. So there you go, a 12 seed's already beaten a five, and SMU better be careful versus Southern Miss. Even though I'll show the overalls of the teams, they don't seem to make that big of a difference. And to stay in this one, the 13 seed probably needs to pick up this fourth and eight, but they do. So their drive stayed alive, but now it's fourth and one, and that's going to be caught as well. They're in a tough position being down by nine because they're behind by two possessions, but but they still have all three of their timeouts left, and Frank Gore Jr. gets them the first. Now they need just six more yards to reach the end zone, and that's what they do here. So if their defense could get them the ball back, we could be witnessing an upset. And it's on SMU to close this one out, but they've decided to pass instead of run on second down, and it paid off. I guess they trusted Preston Stone to not mess that one up for them. And now on second and 11, Jalen Knighton is going nowhere. That means unless they pick this up, Southern Miss is going to get the ball back with a minute left, but there's a wide open wide receiver, and he is gone to the crib. Jordan Carley just just ended this for SMU, and the Mustangs have avoided being upset in the first round, but Southern Miss put up a good fight, and for a split second, I thought they were about to pull it off. Now we get to see the Heisman winner take the field, and LSU went 8-4 and four in the Sims, so they're lucky to be a 6 seed, but I have a feeling no matter where they were put, they were always going to have success, because they just held Baylor to zero points, and on top of that, Jaden Daniels is very hard to stop. As for who the Tigers will have to face in the next round, though, it'll be one of these two colleges from Alabama, and I don't think it's any surprise that we've witnessed another blowout, because the 
the Crimson Tide were just the better team. With a good defense and Jalen Moro at quarterback, they're hard to take down, so I'm very excited to see them versus LSU in the round of 32. Before that, though, we got the war on I-4, and since I live in Tampa now, I got a pull for USF, but I wasn't expecting them to get off to a 20-0 head start, and ever since then, they've given up 14 straight, so UCF's coming back, and they just got stopped on third down. With a solid drive here, the Knights could take the lead, and they are going to pick up the third and three, so their offense has finally started to figure things out, and John Rice Plumley completes another for 15 yards. There's only about three minutes left on the clock now. He is going to take off, and he's running to the side. I don't know what took him so long to go forward, but the Bulls are collapsing because, like I said, they were up 20 to zero, and I'm hoping that their basketball team doesn't do the same in March. I went out to one of their games this year, and they were really fun to watch, but I'm not sure if they're going to make the tournament unless they win their conference tournament, unfortunately. So by the time this video's out, we'll probably know if they did or not. And what were they thinking running that on fourth down? Now it's not going to take much for USF to seal the win over the Knights. That's a huge run. And with one more first down, they could practically seal this one. But that's easier said than done. And this is up the middle for the first there at midfield. USF wins the war on I-4. And that puts them through to the round of 32. But if Florida State wins, they're going to have a hard matchup coming up. And yes, Jordan Travis is healthy on this roster. So I could see the Seminoles making a run to the final four. However, with three minutes left, they are losing by five points to the 15 seed. And there's no way that Rice actually takes them down. That touchdown gives them the lead. And with the two point conversion, they are going to throw an interception. Jordan Travis has turned it over and they are going to probably just tank him down. But if that DB could have returned it, it would have given Rice a one point lead. And all JT Daniels has to do is get his team in field goal range versus the Seminoles. So Rice has a real opportunity here. It is third and eight though. He's going to sling it and that is going to be dropped. With three timeouts remaining as well, instead of going for it, they've actually decided to punt it back to Florida State. So there's a good chance they never see the football again in this one. But even if they don't, they've put up a really good fight. And my opinion on Florida State maybe making a run to the Final Four has changed. Now I'm going to change my prediction to either Alabama or LSU. So whoever wins that matchup, I think will come out of the South region. And on third and eight, Trey Benson gets it for them. That was just enough for the Seminoles to pull away with the win. So they are moving on to the round of 32. And that concludes all of these matchups in the South region for now. But eventually we'll be back and now we're headed to the Midwest. The Panthers being a 16 seed just makes things hard on Oregon. But I still have a feeling that they'll probably come out on top. And this one wasn't even close with the Ducks winning it by 28 points. Bo Nix only threw the ball 19 times, but that was enough to get his team the win. So they'll be playing either Utah or Northern Illinois next. And the Huskies went 11 and 2 winning the MAC championship, but they're still not a high enough seed to host a first round matchup. So I figured they'd struggle, but with about a minute left, they have a four point lead. And Bryson Barnes is going to have to get his team down the field if they want to come out on top. It's already third and two, and he is simply going to keep this with the read option to move the chains for the Utes, but he's going to get stopped at the 40. And Utah's starting to go through their timeouts, but I don't know why they're running. They're honestly just setting themselves up for failure, and this short pass is going to not help them reach the marker. So because of that tackle, time is still running off of the clock, and with 20 seconds left, somebody's open. This one is coming down to the wire, but they just had a false start, and that might have been strategic because now they're going to go out and catch the pass, which is going to take them into the end zone. And with the last second touchdown, I think the Utes are going to beat the Huskies unless they're somehow able to pull off something with this Hail Mary and they're not. That was a great game with an amazing finish. And in the end, Utah is going to play Oregon next. So that should give us an interesting matchup. And this is another opportunity for an upset. We've only had one real one so far in this tournament with Louisiana Tech beating Tulane. But this time around, the five seeds defense has actually played pretty well. And on first and goal, Texas Tech goes out. They're probably still going to reach the end zone here, but they need a two point conversion. And Tyler Shuck got tripped up, which makes this the third and goal where he is going to just take the sack. That's a huge stop for the Blue Devils because now the Red Raiders have to kick a field goal. And if Riley Leonard can help his team manage this clock the right way, all they're going to need is a couple first downs to seal their win. It looks like Texas Tech is already burning timeouts and on second and four, he's going to keep it, then pitch it. So they are going to come close to the marker. But I'm shocked that the refs actually gave them a first down and that's the home field advantage. Now Duke can't run out the entire clock, but they could leave Texas Tech with not much left. So I'm very interested to see if they run or pass on third and four and they went with the pass, but Riley Leonard has turned it over. He threw it into double coverage and that is big. Texas Tech just got a ton of life and Tyler Shuck is already throwing it deep where it is going to be swatted, but he still has a minute and 15 seconds to get his team a touchdown and this is going to be for seven. He's taken a while to snap the ball on third and three, but eventually he is just going to hand it off to Taj Brooks and the clock didn't stop because they didn't pick up the first down, but they will get this fourth and inches. So that gives them a fresh set of downs where he continues to throw it short. After spiking it and getting a short breath of air, I'd hope that he'd go deeper on this one, but instead he fumbles. And the Duke defense that hasn't allowed Texas Tech to score a single touchdown is going to hold on. That ball should have been caught 
on that play, but it's not going to matter. And the Blue Devils defense looked really good, but no matter who comes out on top, their next matchup's going to be tough. For Ole Miss to be a 13 seed, they were like 6-6 six and six in Sam, so they're honestly lucky to even be in the tournament right now. And Notre Dame got a bad draw, so it's no surprise it's come down to the wire, where that sack's going to force them to take a field goal. I'd assume their kicker can hit from here, and that's exactly what he does. So now with less than three minutes left, the ball is in the hands of Sam Hartman, and he is just going to take it short, which goes over to Chris Tyree. Defense has definitely been more important than offense in this one, as you can see, though. So with both teams only having 13 points, I could see this going to overtime if they can't get a field goal. And Notre Dame is already at midfield where Sam Hartman keeps going short. I wouldn't expect it to keep working, but Ole Miss is giving it to him, and he almost took the sack. But because he stood tall in the pocket, his own lineman didn't knock him over, and they're inside the red zone. This is where it's smart to chew the clock, and that's exactly what they're doing right now. So Ole Miss is never going to see the ball again, and Notre Dame has successfully avoided the upset. We've still only had one in this March Madness tournament, but I'm sure they're going to be coming soon. And after looking at the rest of the matchups in the Midwest region, maybe not now. Three of the last four games consist of max schools as the lower seed, so it's going to be hard for them to get the right result. But Bowling Green has a chance because with two minutes left, they only find themselves down by six. So if the Mountaineers' defense can't stop them, they'd take a one-point lead. But they still need to get about 66 more yards, and Connor Baselak takes the sack. That makes it third and 12, and it seems like he he's just going to check it down, which is not good, because that means it pretty much all comes down to this, and what is he doing? I mean, Bowling Green does still have all three of their timeouts, but if the Mountaineers are in field goal range, this one's already over no matter what, and I cannot believe that West Virginia just lost five yards there. Instead of kicking a field goal and ending it, now they have to punt it back to Bowling Green where that goes to the end zone, and the Falcons have just been given another chance. It's going to be pretty difficult to go the length of the field in 52 seconds, but Connor Bayslack's already thrown it deep, and that is going to be caught. I cannot believe that they they just brought that in, but Bowling Green has a real shot. He is going for it again, and these are the exact plays that the Falcons need to be running if they want a chance. He lofted that ball perfectly to the 10-yard line, so even though I thought this game was over, I ended up being wrong. He throws it away, and I wish he wouldn't have spiked it on first down because now it's already third and goal, so it's all going to come down to this last play. He has somebody open. He sees him, and I did too. This is one of the craziest endings we've ever seen, and Bowling Green is moving on to the round of 32, which is nuts because they just pulled off the upset as the 11 seed. I literally said right before that the Max schools didn't stand a chance, and to be fair, I don't think Buffalo does in this one, but we got the upset that we were looking for, and now we're witnessing the blowout that we all expected. Kyle McCord couldn't have played any better than he did, so the Falcons have to play Ohio State next, and since Kentucky couldn't make this tournament, I really don't want to see our rivals, the Cardinals, have any success, but with a minute and a half left, they have the ball up by three on Nebraska, so it's probably not going to be very difficult for them to close this out, and all they need is one yard on third and one, but they decided to to pass it, and that still got them everything that they needed. Jack Plummer didn't play the best, but he did get his team the win, and the real-life national champions are next up on the schedule. They should have zero issues beating Ball State, and they still won the Big Ten in the Sim, but because they dropped a game, they're a two seed. This one was never going to be close, but I didn't think it would be this bad, and I think that's the biggest blowout we've ever seen on this channel. Blake Corum literally rushed for over 200 yards, and that concludes every matchup in the Midwest region for now, so we're ready to move on to the West for the time being, and I could see a 16 seed win winning here. It's a rivalry matchup with the Apple Cup, but the Cougars couldn't keep up, so it wasn't even close. Michael Penix took care of business early, throwing for four touchdowns, so his team will be playing either UCLA or Missouri next, and these colleges are perfectly even on paper. Even with the home field advantage, though, the Bruins find themselves down by eight, and if they don't pick up this fourth and four with two minutes left, they're going to be in a lot of trouble, but the refs are saying that they had just enough there, so their drive stays alive for the time being, and on second down, Dante Moore almost threw a pick. If Missouri would have just caught that it would have already been over for the Tigers, but instead they didn't. So they're going to have to clutch up on this fourth and one where somebody's going to be open. Dante Moore is leading his team down the field perfectly, doing exactly what they need from him. And if they're going to reach the end zone, the goal would be for there not to be any time left on the clock. But the Bruins are taking timeouts, which would just help Missouri, and I don't get that. Now it is third and eight. The pressure is really on here, and Logan Lola's gotten open. He goes down at the one, but they gave them the touchdown anyway, and with the two-point conversion, they get in. With it all tied up at 31, we're most likely headed to overtime, but Brady Cook almost gave UCLA a gift by putting it right in their hands, and after just escaping that, they've run out the rest of the clock. Here on UCLA's first drive, it is already third and 15, where Dante Moore is going to find his receiver, but he goes down just an inch short, and I can't believe what I'm seeing, but they're kicking a field goal. That means all Missouri needs to win this game is a touchdown. Brady Cook is going to throw it, and that's going to be picked off. The Bruins are going to get the win. All he has to do is go down, not fumble, and I can't believe they just survived. I thought they were for sure done after they just took their three, but the eight seed gets the win over the SEC school, so as a reward for that, they get to
to play a one seed next. For this next matchup, I'm probably just going to pull for the upset. And Fresno State's not that much worse than Wisconsin. But with a few minutes left, they found themselves chasing points and they are going to get the two pointer. That's big because if they can stop the Badgers, they get the ball back and they're passing it on second and nine. That's going to stop the clock, which really helps Fresno State. And they're not getting this either. So we have an opportunity for another overtime game and they have plenty of time. That's why they're able to throw it short in that situation as they do it again to get past midfield. And we'll see what Mikey Keene can do for his team. He's simply going to check it down again, but they continue to get lots of yards. So Wisconsin defense needs to step up or Fresno State's going to walk into the end zone. And I can't believe just a few minutes ago, this game was sitting at 22 to seven, but they've pulled off a comeback. With 46 seconds left and one timeout remaining inside the 25 yard line, they should have no issues with clock management. And now that they're on the five, all they need is a few more yards. But that off target pass could have cost them. And I see the running back open, but he takes the sack. Mikey Keene is starting to choke. He got his team all the way down into this position. And now on third and goal, he finds somebody. So we're going to be headed to overtime, but that was a very close call for the Bulldogs. Fresno State got the ball first and it's third and nine where they don't get it. So this one is starting just like the last overtime matchup and Wisconsin could win it with a field goal, but we have seen defenses step up before like we did in the last game and they already have it down to the six or seven yard line. There's somebody open and Bryson Green ends it. Fresno State wasn't able to pull off the upset in the end, but they came very close and I like their effort to come back. So it's a shame that they couldn't move on to the next round, but no matter who comes out on top of this one, they probably would have struggled with them and Ollie Gordon's going to have to have his best game yet because that's the only chance that 13 seeded Oklahoma State's going to have. And I can't believe what I'm seeing right now, but Texas has it on a fourth and five down by 14 where the Cowboys defense just stopped them. That is huge because from here, it's going to be hard for the Longhorns to come back. But after getting that stop, they've moved it down the field pretty well and Quinn Ewers takes the sack. I thought Texas's offense would play a lot better than this, but they've struggled versus the Cowboys defense. And it's all over if they don't pick up this fourth and 13, but they're going to reach the end zone. Well, the Longhorns have a slight chance, but they don't recover the onside kick. So now it's over. And Ollie Gordon didn't even play that well because he wasn't the player that won player of the game, but his 39 yards and one touchdown was still enough to help out. I love seeing upsets though. And that was one I wasn't expecting, but one I could see happening is Boise State over Colorado. Somehow during the sim, they went eight and four. So they got the sixth seed. And with about two minutes left, this one's all tied up at 17 where Boise State is fighting to reach the end zone, but they've been stopped short at the four yard line. And on third and goal, they get in. That leaves Shadur Sanders a minute 42 to move his team down the field and respond back with the touchdown. But if he isn't able to do that, we're about to see another upset. And that's exactly what I was hoping for. Don't get me wrong. I love Dion. I love this Colorado team, but this is a March Madness tournament. We want to see upsets and there's the interception that the Broncos needed. They are going to take it and get past midfield already. This is it. They weren't able to get in field goal range, but they still could without getting the first down. And that would seal the win for them. But we have seen comebacks in situations like that before, but not today. There's nothing that Deion Sanders can do now. And Boise State is moving on to the next round where the 11 seed has pulled off an upset. We just got back to back interesting results, but now we have to rely on Arkansas State to keep it going. And I think they're going to have a hard time on the road at this three seed. Like expected, they couldn't keep up losing by 34 points to the Beavers, but that's because the Oregon State rushing attack was just way too good. And there's a reason that they're a three seed going into this tournament. To follow that matchup, we have Kansas versus UTSA and the Jayhawks will have a healthy Jalen Daniels in this one. So I expected them to go out and thrash the Roadrunners, which is exactly what they did. With that result, they'll play one of these two teams in the next round and the Trojans just made it in as a 15 seed. But with Caleb Williams at quarterback, they're going to be hard to knock out and he is going to fight his way into the end zone. The issue though is so far the Trojans have not been able to get the ball back. So they're going to have to come up with a stop soon and Will Howard gets a couple. This is a huge third and 10, but they decided to hand it off instead of passing for it. And with Giddens coming just short of the marker, they've went for it on fourth and inches, which was the right decision. It was close, but Kansas State just survived against the Trojans and Will Howard moved his team onto the next round while avoiding getting upset by a 15 seed in the West region. To finish the round of 64, now we have the East region. And I've been surprised at how many max schools made the tournament. The only one that's had success in the first round so far has been Bowling Green. But again, I've spoken too soon because of the score in this one with a minute and a half left. Toledo didn't only beat one seeded Oklahoma, they just destroyed them. And Daquan Finn looked 10 times better than Dylan Gabriel did in this game. He wasn't even the reason his team won though, because Jaquie Stewart ran all over the Sooners. And that was not a result I was expecting from the first round. That's the beauty of March Madness though. And next up, James Madison actually gets to host a game, but they've had a hard time keeping up with Tennessee as they're down by 14 with a minute left. Even if they do get in here, they would need to score another touchdown and get the onside kick. And we've yet to see one of these recovered in this video as Tennessee is going to pick this up and end the game. It was a good effort, but the volunteers come out on top and they've lucked out getting to play Toledo in the next round. Clemson didn't have the best season in real life, but they were decent in the sim. So that's why they get to go into this one as a five seed. And it would all be over 
if they could simply pick up this third and four, but because they fell short, South Alabama still has a slight chance, and on fourth and 12, they don't convert. The Tigers are moving on to the next round, and they'll be playing one of these two ACC schools, but if I had to guess, it would probably be North Carolina, and it is nuts to me how much Drake May has struggled against Wake Forest, but he completes this pass, and they're inside the five. Tez Walker had a big grab there, and now Omari and Hampton's gonna get the toss to the left side of the field. So they took the lead, but Mitch Griffiths has been trying to lead Wake Forest down the field anyway, and up until he took that sack, he was doing a pretty good job on second and 17. He's gonna throw it straight to the Tar Heels, though, and that interception is gonna go back to the crib for a pick six. From here, there's not much the Demon Deacons can do, even if they're able to reach the end zone, and they're gonna need a serious miracle if they want any chance of coming back. But once again, it comes down to the onside kick, and North Carolina is gonna pick this one up easily and break a tackle or two. Drake May's going on to the round of 32, and if he wants to beat Clemson, he's gonna have to play better than he did there. But now all of our focus is on Virginia Tech and Mississippi State, where the Bulldogs have already won one matchup in this tournament, and they're looking to get another as with a minute and a half left, they have a six-point lead on the Hokies, and they almost picked it. Kyron Drones tried to give them the game, but they weren't able to hold on to the football, and now they're leaving somebody open who's gonna break the tackle and take it all the way down to the 25. So six-seeded Virginia Tech is starting to move it, and that check down gets them another eight or nine. After all of that, though, they're spiking the ball. And I don't know why they'd waste a down like that, because there's still plenty of time remaining. But they're still in a hurry, and Kyron Drones is going to almost throw a pick again. Those are mistakes that you cannot make in this situation. It's the same play. So of course they were all over the football. And if Mississippi State could just grab an interception, this game would be over. They're throwing it again. And if I had to guess where this ball was going on fourth and 10, I wouldn't have thought halfback screen where it's going to get them enough. Mississippi State should have already won this game like five times. But instead, I don't think they're going to pull off the upset and the flat is wide open. The contain almost intercepted it and now they're just handing it off. So finally, they reach the end zone and Will Rogers has his work cut out for him with less than 30 seconds left. But all Mississippi State needs is a field goal, so they still could come out on top. And completing that pass inbounds really hurts them. It's now third and three. There's not much time remaining. And they're just going to have to send up a prayer on this fourth down, but they took it short. Six-seeded Virginia Tech is going to survive, so they're moving on to the next round. But unfortunately for them, they're probably going to have to play Georgia. And if Army won this one, I would be stunned. They're almost 20 overalls worse than the Bulldogs. And it took the Black Knights the entire game to score, but at least they put up some points on the scoreboard. Carson Beck did pretty well, throwing for four touchdowns, and that leaves us with just two more first round matchups. This one's a very even one with both teams being an 84 overall, but NC State does have the slight edge since they get to host, and with less than three minutes left, they find themselves trailing by three, but somehow that was completed, and the Wolfpack don't need much more to score a touchdown. MJ Morse is going to try to run for it, and he doesn't make it. It seems like they're going to settle for a field goal. They're passing though, and they get in. So now KJ Jefferson has two minutes to score a touchdown to help his team respond against NC State, and on second and seven, he has plenty of time back in the pocket, but he just goes over to his flat. It's taken them over 30 seconds to move the ball seven yards, so that's not a good sign of what's to come in the future, but maybe they'll start going for some longer throws, and he's trying to run with his legs instead. His lineman almost got in the way, or I guess it was his tight end. Either way, that did not work out for them there, and as they get it to exactly midfield, they're starting to burn through timeouts. That's why it's so crucial to get out of bounds every so often like they did there. Now they're picking up the first, and I'm starting to think that Arkansas is going to reach the end zone, but they still have a little bit of work still to do. KJ Jefferson fumbles it away too, but it's picked up, and the Razorbacks are probably a little bit panicked right now as he's just going to go down with a sack. Now they're going to spike it to stop the clock, and that makes it third and 11 where the halfback screen is boxed up. It was all looking so good for Arkansas a few plays ago, but now they do that, and NC State's going to defend their home territory. It wasn't pretty, but a win's a win, and they'll most likely be playing Penn State next, but you never know, the Spartans could pull off the upset, and with a minute and a half left, Michigan State actually has a three-point lead. Now the Nittany Lions do have the ball, which means if they score a touchdown on this drive, they'd be fine. But Drew Aller almost turned the ball over there, so under this much pressure, he might make some mistakes. That one would get them past midfield, and on third and three, he just checks it down to move the chains. So the Spartans have to do a better job on defense, not leaving stuff like that open, or by sending pressure like they did on that last play, and then they did it again, so he had to get this one out extremely quick. I cannot believe that they got the first down there, but it worked out for them, and Caden Saunders catches it again. So even though they had to spike it on the next down, it's just third and one, and that's going to be easy to pick up. From this point, they really don't need that much more to reach the end zone and take the lead against Michigan State, but they are going to waste it down by spiking it. So unless Drew Aller throws for a touchdown here, we're going to be headed to overtime, and he steps up to find a receiver, but he couldn't hit his target. That would have been game, but instead we're headed to overtime. And on their first drive, Michigan State stuck on a third and seven, where they are just going to fall short of making it. That means the Nittany Lions are going to get a stop, and the chances of the 15 seed pulling off the upset aren't looking good. All Penn State has to do is make sure that they don't mess this up. But taking a sack
back, there's a big deal, and Nick Singleton goes nowhere. Now it is third and 18, and Drew Aller's just going to throw it deep, or it is going to be intercepted. Michigan State's going to get the win, and I was not expecting the 15 seed to pull this off. Penn State fans can't believe it, but the East region had some wild results in it, and now we're headed back to the South to start the round of 32. If you thought things were getting good, this is just the start, and the one-seeded Florida Gators better play better because they're the lower overall team. I couldn't tell you what it is, but they've won yet another game pretty easily, and Sim seems to favor them, so they might be a harder out than I thought they would be, especially since their next opponent is one of these two programs. 12-seeded Louisiana Tech already had to pull off one upset, so I figured their run was done, and it pretty much is unless they pull off a miraculous comeback, but they throw a pick, and with that turnover, SMU can seal their win. That means it's Florida versus the Mustangs in the Sweet 16, and on the other side of the bracket, it's time for the big game. Like I said earlier, I think the winner of this one will end up making the Final Four, and with three minutes left, it's all tied up at 17, but Alabama's not picking this up, so they've had to punt it back to LSU, where Jaden Daniels just throws this one away. He's gonna have to do a little bit more than that if he wants his team to come away with the win, and there's no way that's caught. So it is already third and long, and I feel like they're about to get held to a three now, but he steps up, completes the pass, and they move the chains. That alone could be all it takes for LSU to eventually go down the field and win this game, but they still have to get in field goal range, and they're not there yet. Plus, they're committing false start penalties, so it is second and 16 where they're gonna get it out, and that's gonna lead to a reception that takes them to the 40-yard line. Even with the home field advantage and being the higher seed, it seems like Alabama is about to fall to the Tigers, and they can't even make the tackle. So I would assume that it's pretty much over for them, but he's gonna sling it deep, and they could have picked it. There is way too much time left for them to be playing stupid like that, because now they're gonna get this. But if they wouldn't have, they would have left the Crimson Tide plenty of time, and they're not chewing the clock. I don't understand why they're not, and Jaden Daniels can't get out of the pocket. So it is third and 15. I'm wondering if they're even in field goal range, and this check down might not be enough. We're about to find out how comfortable they are taking it from here, and that's in. So Jaden Daniels might have done enough, but Jalen Milrow has a chance to respond back, and he's going to get this one out straight to LSU. There was also a penalty on the play, which doesn't help Alabama, and that backs them up to the 15-yard line, where they have a long way to go. This is such a big result in this region, and it couldn't have been any closer than it's been so far, but it seems like the Crimson Tide are going to fall short versus the Tigers, and McClellan is fighting, but that's not going to be enough. He did everything he could there to get out of bounds, stop the clock, and set them up decently on this fourth and five, which they're going to get, but they still need about 10 more yards to get into field goal range, and Jalen Milrow is going to go down. They could have pulled it off, but now they're going to try to spike the ball, and I'm not sure if they're going to get this off in time. So LSU is going to go into Alabama's place, take them down, and move on to the Sweet 16 to play the winner of the next one. Now, I know this probably won't be pretty for USF, but shockingly, with two minutes and 15 seconds left, Florida State's trailing by seven, and they are going to make a catch here. That was fourth down, and I wasn't sure if they'd pick it up, but now it's 17 all because Jordan Travis was able to pull that off, and they're taking the sack. Byron Brown ran straight into Jared Verse, and now he's going to just do it again. So USF's putting together a terrible drive, and they're just trying to run out the rest of the clock. Florida State's not going to let that happen, though, as they've burned a timeout, and they're still going to have about 30 seconds left while being in decent field positioning. So even though for a split second, it looked like USF might actually win this, I think the Seminoles are going to avoid the upset like they probably should have, and Keon Coleman keeps moving it for them. By now, I'm going to assume that the computer thinks they're in field goal range, but they could make some dumb mistakes. And instead, Jordan Travis made it so they didn't even have to kick three. He ended up having a very good fourth quarter, and going into the Sweet 16, this is what the South region will look like. But before we see how that plays out, it's onto the Midwest region, and the one-seeded Ducks don't have an easy matchup. Utah has a solid defense that could stop Bo Nix, but evidently not because the Ducks have had no issue running up the score, and they dominated this game, but that's also because Bryson Barnes really struggled. With that result, they'll be playing either Duke or Notre Dame next, and I find this matchup to be interesting because Riley Leonard's transferring to Notre Dame next year, but for now, he's a Blue Devil, and he's trying to get his team the win. With a few minutes left, they're very close to taking the lead, but they need to get some more yards, and he is going to make it to the one. Now it's third and goal, and the handoff gets them enough, but the Irish's defense almost held on, and now it's all on Sam Hartman. He has to drive his team down the field and get them a touchdown, but I don't know what that was on second down, and that was a great blitz by Duke. So now it is fourth and four, where they have to pick it up to keep this drive alive, and instead, Sam Hartman throws it straight to the Blue Devils. This is gonna result in a pick six. That's it. It'll be very hard for Notre Dame to come back from here, and Sam Hartman didn't play very well, so that's why the Irish lost. Duke's rock-solid defense has gotten them to the Sweet 16, and Bowling Green's looking to pull off another upset, but this one's going to be much harder to get than the last one, and as expected, the Buckeyes are going to take down the Falcons, but at least they only lost by 18. It was a respectable effort, and if Michigan wins this, they're going to be playing Ohio State for a spot in the Elite Eight next round, and I cannot believe it, but Louisville is putting up a fight against Michigan. They're only losing by three with two minutes remaining. Jawar Jordan just stiff-armed him, and they're inside the red zone, so they're 
they're closing in on potentially getting a touchdown here. But Jack Plummer has zero pocket awareness, so he took that sack. And on third and 12, he's going for it deep, but it's going to be knocked down. That leaves Michigan with plenty of time to get the game-winning field goal or touchdown. And I'd assume they'd go for it, but sometimes the computer does weird things in this situation, like take it to OT. So it's nice to see JJ McCarthy hiking it already, and he is about to take the sack. Now, just like I predicted, he's not hiking it. But this is the smart move, because if they mess up this third and three, they would have left the Cardinals plenty of time. And the Cardinals are faced with an early third and four, where Jawar Jordan catches the halfback screen, but doesn't get anywhere. That's a huge stop for the Wolverines, because now all they need is a touchdown to beat the Cardinals, and that shouldn't be too hard to come by. JJ McCarthy's already thrown it to the five, so it seems like the two seed isn't going to go out now, and he pitches this, but they are going to come short of the end zone. The Cardinals defense could still step up, but they don't, and Blake Corm gets Michigan on to the next round. It's always interesting to see who comes out on top of those close finishes, and I'd say the Midwest region's one of the toughest ones there is, because when you look at ones like the West, it's just not as intimidating, and I could see Washington running through it relatively easily, but it does help that they have home field advantage at their beautiful stadium, and I've never been out West, but if I did, it would probably be in either Washington or Oregon, but I'll get back to talking about this game, which is already over as we can see, and Michael Penix Jr. is always going to have a good performance. Outside of Jaden Daniels, he was the second best quarterback in college football, so I doubt either of these teams really want to face him, but 13 seeded Oklahoma State already upset Texas, and it's been a low scoring game, but it seems like they're also going to do the same to Wisconsin, who has not been able to score. If they want to come back at this point, they need to score a touchdown pretty much on this play, and that's just not going to happen as it's somehow in slow motion, but 19 breaks free, and he goes out around the 20, but there's only a few seconds left on the clock, and Ollie Gordon has carried his team into the Sweet 16. They're the only double-digit seed to make it there so far, but Boise State could as well if they win this, and I wouldn't put it past them to pull off the upset. With about two and a half minutes remaining, they find themselves only down by two, but that's fumbled out, and the Broncos are very lucky that it rolled that way. Now they're going to the four, so they don't need much more yardage. This is a handoff that is stopped short, and being this passive could come back to bite them. They've given DJ way too much time. All he has to do is get his team down the field for a field goal, and completing that pass was almost pointless because it just drained 20 seconds off the clock. It only got them one yard, and now it is third and nine where he gets it out over to his receiver who's going to take it to midfield where he also breaks a tackle, and he is still going. There's only one defender that could potentially catch him, and he does. Anthony Gold just had the play of the day, and from here, Oregon State should just chew the clock to run out the rest of it, but instead, they're going to take their touchdown, and with the two-point conversion, they're also going to catch it. However, the refs are saying that number 12 didn't get a foot down and bounce, so Boise State could win it with a touchdown, and they immediately throw an interception that is going to be taken back for a pick six. That's like the third time we've seen that happen in this video already, and the Beavers are going to hold on to avoid the upset against Boise State. For a second, it didn't look great for them, but they took care of business like they needed to, and the Sunflower Showdown should be very interesting. Kansas State gets to host it, but Kansas has also been a solid team. So I figured it might be close, and with about three minutes left, Kansas is down by 10. They're going to throw an interception. Jalen Daniels has turned it over, and we're witnessing another one. That will pretty much seal things for the Wildcats, who'd end up winning by six after the Jayhawks tried to come back late. And that concludes everything in the West region for now, but I'm excited because after we get through the East region, we're ready for the Sweet 16. Nine-seeded Tennessee probably wasn't expecting to host a game in the tournament, but what I wasn't expecting was Toledo to be up 35-14 to to start the fourth quarter, and Daquan Finn cannot be stopped. They'd end up winning by 29 points, and his stat line looked incredible. But how is this 16 seed now dominated against two big-time programs? I want to say that their luck will run out at some point, but they haven't been in a close matchup yet, and they're going to play the winner of this one. Now, with about two minutes left, it's all tied up at 21, but Clemson has the ball, and Will Shipley fought hard to get them that first down there. Now, Cade Klubnick throws it out, so that makes it second and 10, where he is simply just going to go back to the left side of the field, and why would he throw that? There was no chance of him reeling that in, and they're not in field goal range, but Adam Randall makes the catch, and there is not a safety in sight. However, with a missed extra point, North Carolina could win this game with a touchdown, and that is massive for the Tar Heels, but they have a long way to go. Drake May is a quarterback that could lead them down the field if he makes the right read over and over, but that is asking a lot out of him because this Clemson defense is pretty solid, and his offensive line didn't even try to block for him there. They got in pressure immediately. Now he's going to throw the interception. That was not the right read that he needed to make, and they're just done. To be honest, either Clemson or Georgia is probably coming out of this region. But to make that happen, the Bulldogs have to continue to win. And we've seen what the Hokies can do whenever they're put under pressure. But I would have never expected them to only be trailing by two with a minute and a half left. And with that completion, they're on the Bulldogs side of the field as they continue to push it. All they have to do is kick three to win this game, but they keep handing it off. So now it's third and three. They've taken the clock down to 17 seconds. And why would they do that? Now they can't even attempt the long field goal. They have to go for it on fourth and eight and they pick it up. But they really put the pressure on themselves and now they're taking a sack. To make matters worse, instead of calling their timeout, they're trying to 
spike the ball and George is gonna actually survive. I cannot believe how that game ended, but we're used to seeing odd things happen in these tournaments, and it's about time that I start to record another imperialism as well. With two and a half minutes left, the Spartans have it on a third and four, and NC State desperately needs to get a stop, but instead they're gonna miss two tackles and give up a touchdown. So I don't know what their defense was doing in that situation, but they've made it hard to come back, and why are they punting on fourth and 17? I guess they're just forfeiting at this point. The Spartans are gonna beat the Wolf Pack as a 15 seed, and I would have never predicted them making it all the way to the Sweet 16, but they have, and that concludes all of our games in the round of 32. Now every region only has four teams left in it, and starting in the South, one of these two will make the Elite Eight. Florida going undefeated during the Sim has really benefited them, but now they're facing off against the toughest team they've had to play against yet, and Preston Stone still hasn't gotten sacked, but that was a bad throw. If he would have just set his feet, his team could have taken the lead with a touchdown, but instead, it looks like they're going to get held to a field goal because they have to pick this up and they don't. It's going to be all tied up at 17 with three minutes left, and I'm curious to see what the Gators have done that's made them so successful. It looks like Montreal Johnson Jr. is going to get like 15, and on this next play, they're going to keep it on the ground again with him up the middle for another few. Running must be their bread and butter that's worked for them so well in this sim, but now it's third and eight. Graham Mertz has to get this for them, and he doesn't. That means if SMU puts together a good drive, they could take the win over the one-seeded Gators, and on second and eight, Preston Stone is going to take the sack. From here, there's really not that much they can do unless they get lucky on third down, and that is not going to happen. So things are looking pretty good for Florida. All they have to do is get into field goal range. That punt is not going to pin them that far back, and they only need to get like 10 or 15 yards here. Graham Mertz is going to get them that as he checks it down, and Ricky Pierce will get them to the 30. SMU's defense was a little questionable, but it is what it is. Now they go out of bounds, and on second and five, the handoff up the middle gets them a few more. From here, I'd expect them to chew the clock, and that's what they're doing. But for whatever reason, they're running it all the way down. This is the final play of the game, and why didn't they take a field goal? Now we're headed to overtime, and Florida's in some serious trouble as SMU's going to reach the end zone. So it feels like the Gators have just blown it for themselves on third and nine. They don't do anything, and the Mustangs are really putting on the pressure. They're about to be the second one seed knocked out of March Madness as they don't pick this up, and I cannot believe that the Gators just lost that game. All they had to do was kick the field goal, but a dumb mistake cost them a spot in the Elite Eight, and they'll be facing one of these two programs next. My prediction is still LSU to make it all the way to the Final Four, but with two minutes left, they find themselves down by four, and Jaden Daniels throws it away. Now it is third and five, and he is simply going to loft it up to the Seminoles defender, but it was dropped, so they have another opportunity, and he couldn't get it out. That means if the Tigers don't get a stop, they're not going to get the ball again, and on second and 11, Trey Benson needs to pull something off here where he keeps on going, and they're not able to take him down. That effort alone's pretty much going to seal it for the Seminoles, and with no timeouts left, there's not that much that LSU can do as they get another first. Jaden Daniels had a good run in this tournament, but he isn't able to take down Florida State, and a healthy Jordan Travis with Trey Benson is all they need. The winner of this will then go on to the Final Four, but we still have three other regions we have to get through first, like the Midwest, and Dukes fought hard to get into this position, but now they have to take down a one seed on the road, and their defense has been pretty solid, but the offense has not, as it is a fourth and four that they're not going to pick up, and they still only have seven points. From there, Oregon would simply just run out the rest of the clock, and they're awaiting their opponent in the Elite Eight, where I'm stoked to see which of these teams ends up making it. As of recently, I'd consider this the biggest rivalry in college football, and with a minute and a half left, it is a very tight game. Michigan is trailing by five points, but they also have the ball, which gives them an opportunity to potentially come back here. And that was a great play from them to pick up about 20 yards. Now they're going to hit it underneath for another six, but there's only a minute left on the clock, so they have to start getting some bigger gains, like this one where their tight end takes it to the 40. The fact that he continues to get out of bounds as well is a massive deal. Roman Wilson's going to make the catch to get him 20 more, and the Buckeyes defense is starting to crumble when it needs to step up. Blake Corm catches this one for another couple, but even if it didn't go for much, he stepped out of bounds like they needed, and Roman Wilson is open in the end zone. He just got Michigan a one-point lead, but this two-point conversion is also very important, and what are you doing, Donovan Edwards? He just froze up on the half-yard line. All he had to do was take it in, but because he didn't, now Ohio State can win with just a field goal, and Kyle McCord is going to break one sack to get this ball out. That was an amazing play from him, but why is he handing it off on second down? And now they're not snapping the ball, so this play calling has been atrocious. It looks like the Wolverines are going to get the win, and that seals it. Michigan continues to stay alive in the Midwest region, and they'll be playing Oregon for a spot in the Final Four, but now we're on to the West region where Oklahoma State's made a great run, and we'll see if the 13 seed can keep it up versus Washington. I have a feeling that they're going to put up a pretty good fight, but what I would have never guessed is them winning by three possessions, and Ollie Gordon had himself a day rushing for two touchdowns, but the real story was how bad Michael Penix was, and why didn't he throw the ball much? I've done a lot of sims, and I've never seen Washington's offense play that bad, but the random results is the beauty of the March Madness tournament, and we have a real underdog run going on right now, but we'll see who they play next. It seems like it's going to be Kansas State, and this one wasn't close
close either. But we've had so many tight matchups recently, so that's fine. And one of those two teams is going to make it to the final four. But now we're on to the East region where the 15 and 16 seed are still alive. So there's an opportunity for an even higher seed to advance to the lead eight. And in their first two games, Toledo has blown out both of their opponents, but they've struggled to do the same against the Tigers. So with two minutes left, they find themselves trailing by 13 points. And on third and three, Daquan Finn has his running back open. He's not taking it though, and there's the sack. Clemson's defense stepped up when they needed to, and he just went to his flat on fourth down. So Toledo's not going to pull this off. And it's a shame because the 16 seed played so well earlier on. Will Shipley dominated against their defense though. And now it's time for the final Sweet 16 matchup. Michigan State's also made a deep run to get here, but there's a reason that going into this March Madness tournament, they're a 15 seed. And eventually it was going to catch up to them, but the Spartans are trying to come back. So honestly, not all hope is lost for the 15 seed, but they're going to have to step it up defensively. And Carson Beck just threw a laser over to Brock Bowers. That still doesn't fully seal the Bulldogs win though, because even though the Spartans have zero timeouts remaining, Georgia can only get the clock down to about 45 seconds left and they passed it on third and 12, but it almost worked. They should be able to pin them down inside the 10 yard line though, if this is a good punt and it goes too far. So Michigan State could tie it all up with a field goal and they're already getting a deep pass inside the 40. Not only could they potentially kick three, but they might as well go for the win. And what are they doing? Hoosier just floated that ball perfectly to them. And now they're faced with a third and 10 where they're sending in a lot of pressure and that ball is going to be intercepted. I don't know what type of read that was, but it was not a good one. George is going to move on to the lead eight and Carson Beck has gotten his team there, but it took a close battle against a 15 seed to pull it off. Now we're left with just these eight teams and they're all playing for spots in the final four. So this should be good. And it's the last round that any team's going to have a home field advantage. It certainly helped the Seminoles because I thought this one would be a little bit closer than it was, but instead they blew SMU out and Jordan Travis had an incredible game. Between him and Trey Benson, the Florida State offense just couldn't be stopped. So the Seminoles are the first college to make the final four and Michigan could still sneak in as well, but they're going to have to beat the one seeded Ducks on the road. With two and a half minutes left though, they find themselves down by four. So it seems like Oregon's about to move on unless they can put together a good drive and Blake Corm is going to break one tackle to get them a little bit more, but it is still already third down. And why would they call that play? I don't understand what the Wolverines are doing, but punting it back to the Ducks is not the right move, even if they have a good punter, because now they have to force a three and out and they're not set up to have good run defense here as Bo Nix is going to take it for five. Now on second down, Bucky Irving gets blown up. So Michigan isn't out of it yet. They send in a blitz and it works. They have one more opportunity to tie things up and send it to overtime. JJ McCarthy goes underneath and that did not help them at all because they're spiking it. Through their first two downs, they've moved it zero yards and on third and 10, they're not getting anything either. So it's all going to come down to this and JJ McCarthy is not going to help them pick it up. That means the Ducks are headed to the final four and Bo Nix is carrying this team, but to win it all, he still needs to get a couple more wins. We actually have a big 12 matchup for this next one and I can't believe 13 seeded Oklahoma State still in this thing, but they've continued to put up good fight after good fight and with just a few minutes left, they're only trailing by six. They're down inside Kansas State's red zone. Alan Bowman throws it to the five, but that's not enough for a first, so it sets up a third and two, and I really didn't like that play call. If they're not able to pick this up, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. Ollie Gordon goes down, and all the Wildcats have to do is run out the rest of the clock on them. It does help that they have all three of their timeouts left, but they still have to come up with some stops, and I was not expecting a pass on second down. That alone could seal the win for them. On third and one, they're going to be knocked down, though, and that mistake from Will Howard could cost his team if the Cowboys can just score a touchdown. Also, I have been sick for like the last week, if you can hear it in my voice, very congested. I just wanted to point that out. So that's why sometimes I don't sound the best. I apologize for that, but I did see some comments about it and Ollie Gordon doesn't get much. They still have a ton of time to reach the end zone though, and his linemen are giving Alan Bowman plenty of time as he finds a receiver, but it's dropped. I could not tell you why he tried to bring this in with just one hand, but it could cost the Cowboys a spot in the final four, and it looks like they're still getting the first. With a minute left on the clock, if they're going to reach the end zone, they need to be smart about how they do it, not going out of bounds, but they just get in here and they've given Will Howard a ton of time. All he has to do is get his team in field goal range and that throw gets them like five, but I think the computer's about to glitch out and it always happens like this. Now there's only 10 seconds remaining. They have all their timeouts. So I don't know why they do that and take so long to hike the ball, but they're still going for field goal range and they've actually gotten there. What a throw from Will Howard. Phillip Brooks makes the catch and the field goal is in. So in the final seconds, Kansas State gets the win and 13 seeded Oklahoma State just choked. The game did everything thing they could to help them get into the final four, but it wasn't meant to be. And this is for the last spot. These are the two highest seeds remaining now in the tournament. And it's all tied up at 31 until Georgia just got in. That leaves Clemson with a minute and a half to respond back. And Cade Klubnik finds one of his receivers, but they still have a long way to go if they want to get it down the field. And this was almost picked. You cannot be throwing it in the double coverage like that.
that and this dump off to Will Shipley didn't get him much. So it is third and six. The pressure is on and what was that pass? I could have thrown it better than that, but Clemson needed to pick this up. And because they didn't, they're in a lot of trouble, but they still have all of their timeouts. So they could force a three and out to get the ball back and it seems like they will. I mean, it looks like they've been able to keep the Bulldogs out of field goal range, but Carson Beck could change that here. And now the Bulldogs kicker has a chance to increase their lead to 10 as he does not make it. That helps out the Tigers a lot because they're starting this drive in better field positioning, but they're testing Malachi Starks and he was never going to let that fly. He should have just picked it off, but he didn't. So Clemson is still in this one. Completing that inbounds was not the right decision. And for an offense that scored 31 points in this game, they have not been impressive when we've watched them as that is it. Cade Klubnix lost his team this game and Georgia is headed to the final four. There's only a few games left in March Madness now. And the first one's between these two teams where the Ducks are the only one seeded team from the sim remaining. Now, I thought the Seminoles might put up a better fight than this, but they didn't. They lost by 28, but that's because Jordan Travis did not play well while Bo Nix played amazing. I was rooting for a close game, but we didn't get that. So I'm hoping this other Final Four matchup goes differently and we'll see which one of these teams is going to play Oregon in the championship. Well, by the looks of it, we're getting another blowout and Will Howard put up stats that would get him recruited to Iowa. So it's safe to say these two programs deserve to make the championship and on paper, they're very even, so it should be a good game. After those Final Four matchups, I'm just hoping for the best. And with four minutes left, Georgia has the ball down by seven points. So this is exactly what we were hoping for. This one should have a very tight finish. And Carson Beck is keeping his team alive on this next down. He throws it away. But that was only first down, so it shouldn't make that much of a difference. But after running backwards, it's safe to say that will not help them out. Dejon Edwards catches this halfback screen. He breaks a tackle, but he doesn't get enough. So they have to go for it on fourth and four. And Carson Beck had enough time to find a receiver to get him the first. The Ducks could have just ended it there, but they weren't able to stop the Bulldogs. Now he keeps it. And on second and four, he is going to just go over to his running back. That makes it a third and short where they go with the play action and Georgia continues their drive. So we'll see what they draw up on first and goal and that's down at the one. They really don't need that much more, but they're going to lose some yards and we could not be asking for a better championship. I see somebody open, but Carson Beck couldn't hit him. It all comes down to this where the Ducks defense is going to not step up. And after starting this drive on their own 11 yard line, the Ducks have decided to pretty much just take it to OT. So it's time to see who comes out on top here and on their first drive, Oregon has the ball first. Bo Nix has been so good throughout this entire tournament and we can safely say the same has been true in this game, but they need to get a little bit more on third and four and this pass is going to almost be picked. Now Georgia can win it all with a touchdown against them and the Bulldogs have a real opportunity they need to take advantage of here. After losing in the SEC championship in real life, they had no chance of making the playoffs, but maybe they deserve to do so because they're so close to winning it all and on third and four, they just take the sack. We also know there's no guarantee they'll hit this because their kickers already missed one and this is in. I truthfully believe that Georgia was just going to win it with a touchdown there, but Carson Beck was the reason it didn't happen and these sacks could end up costing his team greatly. It is already third and long and if he takes another, they're going to be out of field goal range, but it looks like they almost get the first and I wonder what they're going to do here. Well, this is certainly the passive approach in this situation, but they trust their defense and on first and 10, Bo Nix gets them nine. All the Ducks have to do is be the first team to reach the end zone in overtime as he is going for it and that is going to be caught. So Oregon has won the national championship and it's all because Bo Nix has led them there. Hopefully you all enjoy the March Madness tournament starting soon because we figured out who would win it all if it was in football. And again, my apologies for sounding so sick in this video, but if you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and then enjoy some of my other content on either side.